Thanks for joining us. We need to speak today about the decline and ultimate collapse of the Roman Empire. We also need to talk about the rise of a new countercultural movement which will emerge around the Christian religion. A faith that will develop in many respects as a direct backlash against perceived Roman excesses. Now early on in the empire, Julius Caesar and his successor, Augustus Caesar, were considered wise and just rulers. As the writer Suetonius noted approvingly of Julius Caesar, for example, quote, he administered justice with the utmost conscientiousness, and in particular he enforced the law against extravagance. Octavian, or Augustus Caesar, was similarly remembered fondly for securing the borders of the Roman Empire, building roads, and instituting tax reform. Not all of Caesar and Augustus' successors, however, were as capable, or men who were even indeed focused on addressing the needs of the citizenry of Rome. Instead, we're going to see a very quick problem developing under the new Roman Empire with a series of successive Roman emperors who were not dialed in, men who start to care more about pursuing their own personal pleasures rather than taking care of the business of running Rome. Tiberius, for instance, who ruled between 14 and 37 CE, while experienced in politics, was so unpopular with the public that he spent his last 11 years not even in the city of Rome. Instead, he decamped to the island of Capri and just devoted his life to debauchery, parties, spending a lot of money. Uh, basically, he just checked out of Roman politics entirely. He was followed by Gaius Caligula, who ruled between 37 and 41 CE, a man who became obsessed with exercising his own power. For instance, he demanded that he be venerated as a god. He even had a temple built to his own worship with a life-size golden statue of himself, which was to be dressed in the same clothing that he was wearing that day, sort of like a life-size Ken doll, I guess. He also drained Rome's treasury to pay for his dissolute life and reckless building activities. He was also insane. He proposed that his famous horse be made consul of Rome, supreme leader of Rome. His insanity even led him to carry on an incestuous relationship with his own sister. In fact, people got so tired of his craziness that he was murdered by his own private Praetorian guard. The very men who were expected to protect him ended up turning on him. Rome's next ruler, Claudius, while not evil, was not necessarily a very strong leader either. Claudius, who ruled from 41 to 54 CE, was largely ineffective as emperor because he suffered from several physical ailments like hand tremors. Today we wouldn't think twice about a leader having a few physical infirmities, but remember this is Rome. Romans celebrated bodily strength above all else, so Claudius appeared helpless and weak, even to his fourth wife, Agrippina. And in fact, we'll see that it will be his fourth wife, Agrippina, who will shorten Claudius' life significantly. She will have him poisoned so that you, she could steer her son from a previous marriage, Nero, into the position of emperor. And that's how we end up with Nero taking over as leader of Rome. Unfortunately, while Nero's rule began in a rather promising fashion, his tutor Seneca had trained him in good leadership and being responsive to the needs of the population. As Nero got a little comfortable in office, uh, he started to take his focus off of actually being a public servant. He actually became obsessed as well with the idea that people were out to get him. His paranoia deepened over time, especially regarding his own mother, Agrippina, who he began to suspect was secretly plotting to unseat her son from power and have him killed. As a result, Nero began trying to kill his mother before she could ha have him killed. He tried several times to have her assassinated by poisoning, and another time by rigging the ceiling over her bed to collapse while she lay in bed. Neither of those things worked. He finally succeeded in offing his beloved mother by having her clubbed and stabbed to death but his suspicions did not die with her. Instead, his suspicions only multiplied. He began to live a life of a recluse. He pursued pastimes such as horse racing, singing, dancing, acting, poetry recitals, sexual exploits like hosting huge orgies. He's wasting taxpayer money. He's not taking care of the needs of the Roman citizenry, and popular frustration mounts. 
In fact, by the time the Great Fire erupted in Rome in 64 CE, the public had really largely turned against their emperor. It ravaged, this, this uh, fire ravaged Rome for six days and consumed thousands of people's businesses and homes and lives in the process. After the f flames were finally put out, many began to spread rumors that Nero had perhaps even started the fire because it was known that he wanted to build a greater, larger palace uh, right in this very sector of the city in which the Rome just coincidentally happened. The fire started in the center of Rome. There were also rumors that he was not paying attention when the fire broke out. Uh, you may have heard the saying that Nero was fiddling while Rome burned. That could not have been the case because the fiddle had not yet been invented as an instrument. But there were other rumors circulating that he was uh, sort of singing and watching the fire consume people's lives below. That he was maybe playing a lyre or these sorts of things. We can't historically verify any of that. but. What matters in this case is that he senses that the public is turning against him. Desperate to try to appease the masses and prevent a wide-scale rebellion, what Nero will do is seek a scapegoat. He's going to choose a tiny little religious group that virtually no one has ever heard of, no one really knows anything about them, and he's going to use them as a scapegoat. He's going to choose an innocent group of people known as the Christians, and he's going to say, they did it. They started the fire. They're responsible for all of this pain and suffering. Let's go after them. And because so few people knew anything about Christians, many people were more susceptible to this type of false accusation. They said, well, maybe that is the case. This ended very, very badly for Christians living underneath the early Roman Empire. We'll see that Nero will have many of them uh, arrested as public criminals. He will have many of them publicly crucified, which was a common punishment during that period for criminals under the Roman Empire. He will have some of them thrown to animals um, in the Colosseum. He will bring others to his palace and have them impaled and lit on fire to serve as human torches during his depraved parties. And so with that in mind, now is a good point for us to learn a little bit about this tiny, at this point, religion known as Christianity under the empire and talk a little bit about how it really develops as a countercultural movement, one that rejects many of these Roman values such as, you know, uh, the ends justifies the means or kill your enemy before they can kill you. Now the origins of the Christian faith are a little bit hazy, at least as far as historical fact is concerned. When we talk about our historical resource for understanding this new faith, we look at the so-called New Testament. Some of the problems with using this document uh, from a historical standpoint is that it, there were multiple authors involved, so it's not one single narrative. Uh, it was written some 25 to 75 years after the death of Jesus of Nazareth, the founder of Christianity. And then also it is largely based on oral history for that very fact that you're not getting first-hand accounts, eyewitness accounts of these things that are, have happened because uh, Jesus of Nazareth had been gone uh, for several decades by the time anyone sort of thought to begin recording uh, these stories. Regardless, it remains one of the very few historical accounts that we have about the life of the founder of Christianity, Jesus of Nazareth who was born into one of these little um, communities of, of Jewish faithful living underneath Roman domination. So by virtue of the fact that he's born into one of these monotheistic communities, uh, Jewish communities living underneath the polytheistic rule of the Romans, that automatically is going to create suspicion on the part of Roman authorities towards all Jews. And of course, they will begin singling Jesus of Nazareth out uh, later in his life, not just for his monotheism, but also for the message that he begins to spread over time. Now there were several different sects of Judaism 
during the first century CE, uh, and I'm not going to go into the particulars of, of each of the of, of these sects, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and, and Zealots. I'll save that for religious history class. But I do like to at least mention that Jesus of Nazareth was born into a particular sect of Judaism known as the Essenes. And they carried with them a belief, not just in an all-powerful monotheistic deity, but they also believed that that deity was going to send a Messiah or a Savior figure Nobody knew when, but that this figure would be sent to the earth to try and convince people to come back to a righteous way of life. And that a day of judgment was coming in which those who had led iniquitous lives would be uh, punished. So keep that in mind because I'm going to circle back to this point in a few minutes. Now we don't have a lot of information on Jesus of Nazareth's early life in the New Testament. We, his religious mission in life appears to have picked up around the age of 30 or so when he reportedly met up with one of the holiest prophets in Judaism, a man by the name of John the Baptist. He was baptized by John the Baptist um, in the River Jordan and became one of his followers. After baptism, Jesus began traveling through Judea, Samaria, and Galilee, preaching to crowds, reportedly performing miracles of healing, and gathering new disciples to the faith. So what was Jesus' message besides obedience to an omnipotent and uh, all-knowing all God? Well, it was similar to that of John the Baptist's beliefs. Jesus preached that the kingdom of heaven was coming. Remember, we said he was born to the Essenes, the idea of a judgment day at hand. That before long, God in heaven would come to rule on earth as he did above, and in the process would punish the wicked and reward the pious. He therefore instructed his followers to pray to God for salvation. And here's where he differs from several other Jewish leaders of the day. He deliberately went and sought to spread this message among communities that had been ignored by fellow Jewish priests. He will deliberately converse with prostitutes, with criminals. He will deliberately go in into communities of those who were suffering from bodily sickness, leprosy, and what have you. Those who had been sort of spurned by other religious leaders. And he spread the message that anyone was capable of salvation, that no matter your prior life history, no matter your you know, uh, physical infirmity, that all of that could be rectified and that, that anyone, it, it, this message of hope was extended to anyone from all different backgrounds. So it's not surprising, therefore, that this message begins to gain traction among those who were disadvantaged, living under Roman rule. So slaves, this is a message they haven't heard. Oh, well, there's something better for me, maybe not in this life, but in an afterlife. Criminals, as I said, those who had been ignored by other religious leaders, sort of forgotten, here was someone that took the time to speak to them and minister to them and offer them a message of hope. Jesus of Nazareth also broke with Roman tradition by emphasizing that love and mercy were greater than the power of tradition or greater than this Roman ideal of, you know, kill or be killed, uh, spreading the message of compassion. So in this way, it's directly uh, sort of uh, flying in the face of many Roman values. And he will also emphasize to his followers that the faithful needed to respect the law of God first and only then secondarily begin to observe the law of man. And this last point is what starts to get him in hot water with Roman authorities. Roman officials began to hear of this, the religious following that Jesus of Nazareth was attracting, and they also become suspicious of the nickname that many of Jesus' followers will attach to him, King of the Jews. Now, while this was meant in a spiritual sense, the Roman authorities are completely ignorant of Jesus' message, and all they're focusing on is the word king. When they hear the word king, they think of someone who has an army behind him, someone who will not submit to Roman rule, perhaps, someone that is uh, maybe formu formulating a rebellion against Roman authority. So this is why he is eventually targeted and ultimately executed by Roman authorities is because they perceived him as a security risk. They didn't really care anything about his message. They thought it was strange, but uh, they saw that this was someone that might be starting a rebellion, even though that was not, in fact, what he was doing. 
Now, while Jesus' death was hardly noticed by our Roman historians, and since he left no writings of his own, this could have dealt a fatal blow to the memory of his teachings. But it was the determination of his followers to keep his message alive that led to the establishment, ultimately, of the Christian religion. And among those followers, Paul of Tarsus was the most instrumental in keeping the message of Jesus of Nazareth uh, awake and, and spreading it, in fact, through a series of missionary voyages throughout the Mediterranean. For this reason, he is sometimes referred to as the second founder of Christianity. So important were his writings. Uh, he never met Jesus of Nazareth personally, um, but he, his faith led him to, to travel to all these different Jewish communities throughout the Mediterranean and to begin spreading the message of his teachings. Paul also is important from the standpoint of declaring that Jesus was, in fact, not just a wise prophet, but according to Paul, that Jesus was actually the Messiah figure or the Savior figure that the Essenes had been searching for for so many generations. So Paul will declare that Jesus was, in fact, the son of their deity and a human woman. He was born of the union between their deity and, and a human woman, and through his death and resurrection, according According to Paul, that this offered salvation to all of humankind. We'll talk a little bit more about the spread of Christianity and ultimately the collapse of the Roman Empire in the second part of this video.